Let's do some questions here. Did Christ pay for the sins of the non-elect, the Reverend DeYoung? No, it's, it's complicated. But yes, I think getting to what I think the question is asking, the short answer is no. Speaking of the, the Synod of Dort, famously the second head of doctrine there deals with redemption and atonement, sometimes called the limited atonement, particular redemption. Uh, there are sometimes disagreements among reformed theologians throughout history on what effect the death of Christ may have had for the non-elect. There's some sort of common grace benefits that accrue, but the real heart of the question is, did he pay for the sins of the non-elect? And the answer to that is no. Jesus says that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the, the sheep. sheep. The sheep, not for the goats, but for the sheep. And the name particular redemption is important because the question is as much about the nature of the atonement as it is about the extent of the atonement, that the two go together. If the nature of the atonement is a substitutionary sacrifice such that Christ died so that all who died in Christ had their sins forgiven, washed away, washed clean, so that they have been made right with God. Well, if that's what the death of Christ accomplished, not merely the potentiality, the probability, the possibility that someone would come to Christ, then the very nature of the atonement necessitates that the extent of the atonement is also limited. So John Owen, this is part of his argument, and... Um, J.I. Packer has that wonderful essay prefatory article before the death of death and the death of Christ where he makes this same point. Spurgeon makes these same arguments as well, that Jesus died not simply to make salvation possible. He did not just remove an obstacle so that now you can come to him, which is in effect what the Arminians were arguing, but rather he died in the place of actual sinners, those actual sinners being the elect, those whom God had ordained to receive the benefits of Christ's death. You will, you will give him the name Jesus, for he will save his, his people. people from their sins. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that's the biblical testimony. It's interesting, if you look at Tulip coming out of the Synod of Dort, it's got the problem Total depravity, it's got the solution, perseverance of the saints. It has the grace of the Father, the grace of the Son, the grace of the Spirit. The Father elects certain persons. The Son atones for the sins of certain persons. The Spirit effectually calls those persons. They're working in concert. Now, if Jesus died, made it, if he died for the forgiveness of everyone's sin, suddenly the Trinity is at odds with themselves. And not only the Bible plainly says that it's an effectual atonement for the elect, but the Father chose certain people. Jesus died. How often does Jesus talk about the people whom you gave me? It, it, particularly in the Gospel of John, he's constantly using that language. Those whom you have given to me. And it's for them that he made atonement. And then, this, it, then, then who then has the effects of that atonement applied to them effectively by the Holy Spirit? The same people whom God elected. So God chose people in eternity Christ in the past atoned for those people's sins. In the present, the Spirit gives saving faith to those people. The Trinity is working at one. The, the, the implications of Arminianism are frankly horrifying. Uh, Trent, let's talk about irresistible grace. Does that mean that God saves people against their will? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, God's, God, by His grace, uh, transforms our will so that we can we can freely come to him so each of these doctrines of grace it seems to me I have a different story in my own in my own life as to how the question got raised the tension was created and then it was resolved with different texts even limited atonement for me was the last one to to get clear the lamb's book of life uh, the priesthood of Jesus he died his work is perfect so that it accomplishes all that he means Amen. for it to accomplish so 
Revelation and Hebrews were the ones that crystallized that for me. Irresistible grace, that's a perfectly legitimate question. You would, you'd become a Christian and you would say, you know, I came, I, I came to, I heard the gospel message and I came to faith and I came and I believed and that was a legitimate actual experience of coming to God. You weren't, um, you weren't coerced, you weren't forced, you weren't puppeted. I thought the illustration last night that, that Kevin gave was just really wonderful. Um, so I think of I think of First Corinthians, Second Corinthians three and four. Our, our we're blind. Our eyes are our eyes are blind. We're blind so that we can't see the light of the glory of God. And God, as He, in the same way that He created at the beginning of the universe, He does something equally or even more incredible in opening our eyes to see who Jesus is, so that we can then come in faith. So we're slaves to sin in Adam. We are perfectly free to obey our every desire, and our desires at base are uh, are like Adam's. We're um, we're slaves to sin, but when God opens our eyes and gives us the new birth, then we have a capacity to believe, and we and we do so freely, having been enabled to. So, uh, no, God doesn't. What's the it's a deck question? Does he? Force our force will. Force our will. Yeah. He doesn't force our will, but he makes it possible for us to believe he freely. Gives us a new heart. Yeah, gives us a and new heart. And then that new heart makes us, make them willing in the day of thy power. That's right. uh, in Acts 16, God opened Lydia's heart. Now, that's a sovereign act, hmm. but the effect was she was willing. We were unwilling. God's spirit regenerates us with the effect that we are willing, and so we are willing because of his sovereign power at work in our lives. Want anything to that? I'm going to give this one, Kevin. Since God ordains the ends and the means, can you explain how God grants us free will to participate in his plan? Free will is... Uh, you have to define free will. When theologians typically... Formal theologians typically talk about free will, they are thinking about... First of all, whether the will is bound to sin or not. That's not exactly what I think this question is asking, but it's important to keep in mind when you read through systematic treatments of the will. Did Adam and Eve have free will in the garden? Depends on what you mean. Were their wills already bound to an inherited depravity? No, they weren't. Will our wills in heaven be free. Well, they'll be free only to choose what is good. Is the regenerate human will, regenerate persons here, is your will now free to choose and to move in the direction of ever-increasing righteousness? Yes. So, strictly speaking, the freedom of the will has to do with the total depravity, that our wills are bound to an ever-increasing wickedness apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we mean by free will. Now, I think what this question is meaning is what philosophers or theologians might call a libertarian free will. So Arminians would understand free will, yes, that conversation with sin, but just do you have the power of contrary choice in your life? Can you make decisions such that they, there are contingencies? And again, you have to... Theologians parse this out very carefully. Within the the dome of this pilgrimage, this life that we live, certainly we all experience at least seeming contingencies. Uh, If you bring your wife flowers on her birthday, one sort of contingency will spin out. If you bring her nothing, and you are absent that evening at a NASCAR event, another sort of contingencies <laughs> will spin out. The our, pastor our, in Charlotte speaks. You know, <laughs> when I came and did my candidating sermon at Christ Covenant, I said, anything I need to know when I come here? And they just said, don't say anything about NASCAR. <laughs> so it's, you come to Greenville to talk about NASCAR. I'm just trying to bring, you know, the culture down here. <laughs> Nobody, there, there are not a lot of big NASCAR fans that I'm aware of at Christ Covenant, I'll say that. Uh, so there are, there are decisions that we make that we all can see real life consequences. Now, are there decisions such that God is in heaven willing A, 
And there is then the possibility of B happening. And the answer to that is no. Whatsoever God ordains comes to pass. That's not only Ephesians 1, 10, and 11, but as we're talking with a brother here, that's a, a good hymn. Whatever my God ordains is right. Uh, Augustine said the will of God is the necessity of all things. Whatsoever comes to pass, not, a, not a, a, a sparrow from heaven, not a hair from your head. Of course, the Bible talks about the will of God in at least two different ways, that will of decree and that will of desire, which gets to this question about the freedom of the will. Even Jesus uses the will of God in these two different ways, which is why we need to define our terms. On the one hand, he can say, whatever happens, it's the will of God. Hairs from your head, sparrows to the ground, the minutest detail in your life, God willed it, and yet he teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There is a sense in which the desire for God to have his commandments be obeyed is something that we pray for. Even in the mysterious workings of providence, those two wills are two sides of the same coin and complement rather than contradict. You know, I think that the expression free will is so loaded that I think it's really not serviceable. I agree. Because it generally means autonomous free will, which we do not have anymore. Uh, but I think, I wonder if the question was getting at this, Kevin. How is God sovereign and yet we have will? We have libertarian free will. How can a sovereign God who's ordained anything have us have real will? And can you explain that? The answer is no, we cannot explain that. And I mean that. The Bible teaches both. Uh, where God makes an end of teaching, let us make a learning. The Bible plainly teaches the absolute sovereignty of God. It teaches full power of contrary choice, well said. Uh, volition, that's real. Uh, how are they both true? I don't, I don't think anyone has ever given an explanation of that, and we don't need to give an explanation where God has not given an explanation. One thing you'll see is all, in every theological topic where the divine and the human, at the point where they interact, there's mystery. The incarnation of Christ, he's one person, fully God, fully man. Where's that line? Don't ask me. You know, is the Bible's the word of God, it's the word of man. We can see how it's both, we can see where it's both. How do they interact? There's mystery. And so we do not have an explanation. Uh, and I think we shouldn't be surprised that we don't have an explanation for how we have will, actual power of choice, in a world that God is totally sovereign on. It's a wonderful mystery. Uh, Trent, let me ask you a question. Well, let's, let's each do your favorite book, book you'd recommend on the sovereignty of God. Let's do it quickly. Kevin, name a book. I'm going to read one book. Come on. You were so a young reformer. What you were a young Calvinist, and you read what book was it you read? Uh, on the sovereignty of God. I mean, Calvin, the oh, Institutes. Okay, R.C. Sproul wrote books chosen by God. Yes, he did certainly chosen by God is is wonderful. You got you got you got one. Oh, what's so great about the doctrines of grace? Oh, God says. Right, Actually, I, I, I did take a look at your predestination chapter. It is plain, it's clear, it's pastoral, Amen, it's precise. I actually, I'm familiar with the book. I've had it for years, and I thank took a fresh you, look at it, and good work. A.W. Pink's The Sovereignty of God is an absolute classic. Thank you. The sovereignty of I mean, Kevin doesn't even care about that. <laughs> so, uh, out of Grand Rapids, right? The, uh, what's, the other, what's the other classic I'm forgetting? Lorraine Bettner on Predestination. Jeff, what's another great Sovereignty of God book? I was on a bus one time in Philadelphia with a, a young woman who was uh, uh, sitting on the other side. She was, she was reading Ch Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. And I said, hey, are you, are you enjoying that book? She said, I'm kind of confused. And she struck up a conversation, and she ended up becoming a member of Tenth Press. When she died, 15 years later, I watched the simulcast of her funeral. And uh, they mentioned at her funeral her reading R.C. Sproul, The Sovereignty of God, or Chosen by God, and me asking her about it. Now, these books are powerful, even though not for Kevin. It's only Turretin. You shouldn't have said Turretin in the Latin. I was about to mention Turretin in the last question, and you went on to another question. <laughs> it, if it, Rick is right. It is a mystery. If, whenever you have mysteries and you want to get as close as you can to understanding the mysteries, read Turretin. That's true. 
So Turretin <laughs> gives six different types of necessity in the human will. And you notice yesterday I was using the language quite intentionally, neither external coercion or compulsion. So that's the, the, the will is bound in certain ways and not in others, which is part of not unraveling the mystery or fully explaining it, but just giving the right sort of categories to, to say, how are we willing what we will? We do will something, even if there is a will prior to our will willing it. Turretin's amazing. It was recently translated into the English. It's a, it's a treasure. Uh, let's go back to you, Trent. Uh, explain the difference. Well, let me, here's a question. Uh, how do we approach someone with help who's suffering, severely suffering, with the fact that God's sovereign? So someone's suffering terribly. How is the sovereignty of God a help to them? Psalm 46 comes to mind. So that's a psalm for the, psalm for the hospital bed. My, my answer is to open up scripture and let the word of God comfort them and convince them. One way we know God's word is, is God's word is when you open it up in moments like that, someone who actually has the spirit finds comfort uh, in getting, it was, I, as I preached on Psalm 46, uh, that's right, I preached on Psalm 46 and a gentleman came up to me afterwards. He had, uh, his name was David Steele and David is, the one guy in our church who would say, amen, just in the middle of the, in the, middle of the sermon. And he was the only, only gentleman in our church that would do that. And later we realized it was partly, at least because of his hearing issue, he was so loud because one time there was a mic issue and he said, sound guy, to his wife. <laughs> so he was, a man, he was a man full of the spirit. He was a man who loved the word preached Psalm 46, spoke about how some of you may have heard that you have cancer this week. He comes up after the service, and he says, he hasn't told his wife yet, and he says, I've got brain cancer. And he just hugs me, and he walks away. It's the best he could do. He's going to have a long day tomorrow. Uh, he's got to tell his wife. Uh, and, and he's died. I had the pleasure of preaching his funeral, David Steele. But it's Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore... We will not fear, though the earth gives way. Not that the earth doesn't give way. It gives way. Though the earth gives way. How bad is it? Though the mountains are moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. He goes on to talk about the raging of nations and be still and know that I'm God. That's where that comes from. Rest in the, my, the fact of my perfect sovereignty over all of these chaotic things. And in the end, of course, we have the full story. Uh, everything does come out if you will, just, just fine. So my answer to that would be get out a psalm, get out scripture, find a scripture that is actually tuned specifically for that kind of suffering. There's a certain kind of suffering that uh, Romans 8 is for. There's a certain kind of suffering that First Peter 1 is for. I don't know if any yeah. of you have, I, I, I hardly get to watch TV and I'm not vouching for this. I've seen two episodes of it, but this new show, Manifest, about the, the plane that disappeared. I don't know if it's sort of loosely supposed to be based on, the, you know, what if the, that Malaysian air flight from several years ago. There's been about two or three episodes. My, my teenage kids wanted to see it. So I said, okay, I'll sit down and, and watch it with you. And so the premise of the show is that five years ago in 2013, this flight went off and hit some storm and something happened and then they landed back and, uh, in, in the States and now it's 2018. And five years have elapsed, except for them. They're all the same age. They're all, and it's sort of what, what, what happens, and people got remarried, and lives moved on, and what's different, and there's sort of these mysteries unraveling. But here's the interesting thing, and I'm just wondering where they're going with this. The, it's Flight 828, Romans 828, and the, the mom, before her daughter and son get on the plane, is saying, Oh, you, you know that, you know, God works all things for good. And, and she shows in the Bible, Romans 8, 28, and the daughter says, you know, Mom, I don't believe that stuff anymore. And then they get off, and then later they see a pillow with, you know, five years later with a needlepoint, 8, 28. Romans. So there's, I, I, I'm not saying there's any sort of Christians behind it. I don't know where the storyline <laughs> is going, but it's interesting. Somebody there making this TV show is weaving into the, thre uh, the thread of this Romans 8, 28, that something, God is up to something mysterious in his working all things for good. I love what Trent said. I think we also need to keep in mind what we don't do with God's sovereignty when people are suffering. 
And that is to throw Romans 8.28 as just sort of a stiff arm. You know, people crying. 8.28, all things for good. Remember? Remember? You know, Paul Tripp helpfully says when we encounter people with any sort of issue, love, no speak, do. So generally that, or, okay, am I loving you? Am I hearing what's going on? You know, the brother who's coming up crying, you know, you, you need that. You need to know. You need to know what they're facing. And then you, you come to a point where you speak. And maybe that's five minutes. Maybe that's five seconds. Maybe that's five weeks. Uh, sometimes we can be clumsy with the sovereignty of God. And it's a way of saying, stop hurting. Stop feeling what you're feeling. You're making me uncomfortable. You should get over it. You should see that God's up to something good. All of those truths are wonderfully precious, and we need to be reminded of them. But there's, there's many times and ways and places to do that that are helpful and some that are unhelpful. Amen. And yet, the sovereignty of God is not only a comfort when we're severely suffering, it is the greatest comfort. What would it mean if, I, if this was just randomly happening to me? If God is not sovereign over this, what is? Face, heartless, faceless, mindless, cosmic forces? Because I know God. This is where Paul's getting at Romans 8. He who, you know, he has already given his son. How will he not also, together with him, graciously give us all things? And so while I don't understand and I don't see how this can be and it's tragic and, and crushing to me because I know that God is sovereign, but he's sovereignly for me, and I prove that by having his son die on the cross for my sin. And so I know there is a redemptive purpose. There is a good end. There is a wisdom guiding it. Now, that doesn't, you're absolutely right, that doesn't take away the tears, but it sanctifies them. And if God was not sovereign, well then, at whose mercy am I? I want to be at his mercy because I know him. And what a comfort it is that God is sovereign. I find pastorally all the time people going through real griefs and disappointments, sometimes crushing trials. What a blessing it is that God is sovereign over this, which means Romans 8, 28 is true, that he's going to do it. We're going to end up praising him. Um, it's the greatest comfort we have. Uh, I'm really back to you, Kevin. So is the sovereignty of God an excuse for an unholy lifestyle? Mega noito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may it, may it never be. Uh, the sovereignty of God is the, the enabling power we have for a holy lifestyle. And this is where we need a biblical definition of freedom. Freedom is not my ability to do whatever I want to do, but freedom is God's given ability in my life to do what I ought to do. So remember the story of the Exodus. It's not just let my people go. Well, Charlton Heston said that very powerfully. But it was let my people go that they may go into the desert and serve me. It was always freedom for the purpose of worship. And so the freedom that we experience from God is not the freedom from just constraint. It's the freedom from the power of sin, freedom from the penalty of the sin, and it's a freedom not only from but to. That freedom leads us to worship and to obey. For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and blameless before him. So what you're doing is you're invalidating your claim to be elect. Now we're all sinners, but we're not, but this kind of celebration of it, seeing, oh, because God's sovereign now, see, I, what I want to do is, is sin. Well, you know, you can be, it's one thing if you're struggling with sin, it's another if you're not struggling with sin. And so the mark of the elect is holiness, and they will all in the end be holiness. So that position is utterly contrary with the biblical uh, presentation. And of course, election is tied to the other doctrines, like regeneration. And so the person who's thinking about his or her own election is someone whose heart's been regenerated and born again, union with Christ. So uh, it's a very alarming argument for people to make if they mean it. Uh, what about the uh, influence of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God on worship, Trent? How does uh, God's sovereignty change or affect our worship? 
<clears throat> Two passages come to mind. First is Romans 12. So in view of God's mercy, what kind of mercy? Well, the mercy we heard about last night is even his electing mercy, his sovereign mercy. Um, offer your bodies a living sacrifice of worship. So certainly all of life is worship, and that flows from the experience of God's sovereign mercy. But then even uh, thinking of the passage just preached this morning, so 1 Peter 2 the living stone, the cornerstone, the stones that join to it become living stones as they're joined to the, to the living cornerstone himself. And we're a, we're a worshiping community. I don't know that that describes the, the gathered church, but the church is itself a worshiping assembly, a worshiping community. And it's, it's capacity to know God. It's, it's freedom from the, forgive, from, from, the, from the penalty of sin. Um, it's new hearts to desire God and worship him are all a gift of his grace. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, so our worship flows from our experience of God's sovereign mercy. You want anything? Yeah. It, it, yes and amen. And it affects our worship in all the things that we won't do because we know it's not dependent upon us. The spirit does not require a certain shade of lighting to regenerate the heart. The spirit does not require a fog machine. The spirit blows where he wills. And so it doesn't, I mean, we still speak in English if people understand English. We still have certain, you know, we, we dress a certain way appropriate for our culture. We're not blind to those things. But it is to say that we are not thinking how must we design worship in order to get this desired effect. We love effects. We love affections. We love change. We love conversion. We pray for it. But believing that it's a sovereign work of God means there are things that we don't do. And it also gives us hope for the things that God will do. And this is as, as much for pastors as for anyone. And I know there's some pastors here and other students and people studying to be pastors. We need to be, I need to be reminded of God's sovereignty as much as anyone, because how many times do we get done preaching and we think, uh, that did nothing. I remember hearing Sinclair Ferguson preach one time. I thought it was a marvelous message where he just, you know, he expounded the, the Trinity and the recesses of eternity past. It was so massive. I thought, were you there, Sinclair? How did you, I mean, it's just, it was just <laughs> beautiful. It was just wonderful. And I he must have said, Sinclair, thank you for that wonderful exposition and, you know, regaling us with the glory of the Trinity. And he said, oh, Kevin, that sermon was a dog's breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, your dog eats very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But I thought, I felt some encouragement because I, I've, I feel that every Sunday, I don't know if it's, real humility or false humility or the devil or just realism about my sermons, but feel, oh, was that a waste of time? Did that do anything? That sermon could have been so much better. Another few hours, I could have had a better illustration there. I don't like the connection there. Some people seem to be sort of dozing off there. And you have to be reminded, did I preach Christ? Was Christ lifted up? Was the Word of God proclaimed? Is God sovereign? All the things that we believe, all the things I teach students and interns, I need to be reminded of weekly. We, we need these doctrines as ministers as much as anyone. Amen. And the sovereignty of God is going to make our worship God-centered in all things. The seeker-sensitive movement, I mean, think Rick Warren's purpose-driven church, you go out and you survey your community, find out what they want, and give them what they want in your worship, and they like your worship. Well, that assumes the sovereignty of the customer. And I don't mean that as a cheap shot. That's just what's going on today. And if we believe that God is sovereign and so pleasing him is what really matters, we're going to worship in a, in a way that his word commands. We talk about what we call ordinary means of grace ministry, word, prayer, sacrament. That's what we do. We don't show videos. No monster truck drives in. There's no stage set in the ceiling for you know people to come in to impress people. We read the Bible, we pray the Bible, preach the Bible, we pray the Bible, we dramatize. We have a drama ministry. It's called Baptism in the Lord's Supper. And, <laughs> uh, the, um, and people go, you're not really, how is that going to work? Because God has ordained it, he's commanded it, he's sovereign. 
So the whole way in which the worship works, this is why, for instance, we're in other godly settings, people we admire in many ways, the altar call is the centerpiece of the worship. Why don't we do altar calls? Well, we certainly invite people. I think every one of us has appealed to believe. The Bible shows that we're to do that. But we don't want to manipulate the human will. We think it's contrary to the teaching of Scripture, and we don't have to manipulate. We can't mani- If we do manipulate the human will with the lighting, with the song, with the emotional, with the harangue, all that, then it was, we're producing spurious conversions because uh, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, well, if it's a flesh and blood, it's not real. So the whole logic of how the worship service works is going to reflect sovereign agency, sovereign reliance, and it's going to be directed to him. I like to say that Second Presbyterian Church believes in consumer-oriented worship, but the question is, who is the consumer? Yeah, that's good. And the consumer is the thrice holy triune God. We want to please him. He is sovereign. Uh, it changes everything about worship. Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, I guess we're back to you. We're, we're over here. I think we've been ping-pong back. Kevin, how do we best interact with those who disagree in varying degrees with the doctrine of grace? Now, surely the answer is we're going to burn them on the internet. If the stake is full, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're going we're gonna to tear them down and mock them on the internet. That's the Calvinistic way, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, I talk about some of these themes tonight from Second Timothy, that we are to bear with our opponents patiently, that's good. And gently, that Calvinists of all people, though it's often not the case, should be known for our humility. Amen. Now, that's not humility as the world understands it. Uh, we can be certain of things that we believe. G.K. Chesterton, not a Calvinist, but G.K. Chesterton said we are in danger of putting humility in the wrong place. We're putting it over the organ of knowledge instead of the organ of ambition. And we're in danger of making a race of men too meager to believe in the multiplication table. That's not what we mean by humility. I'm not really sure. Uh, So people may not accuse us of that, but we must be humble before the Lord and humble before others, knowing that a gentle answer turns away wrath. God has not called you to be an internet hero. I I can say that, most everyone here. He has called you, first of all. You have family, you have friends, you have church, you have people that are under your... And then perhaps there are wider circles of, of people that look to you for influence or for direction. And certainly we can speak through social media and speak through the Internet to things that are true. We must always do it in a way that is seasoned with salt and kindness. And in particular, when we're coming with the doctrines of grace, we must understand that two things. One, people have a lot of misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. For a whole segment of people, uh, many times Baptists in the South, if you resemble that remark, I love you, but many times it's true. Calvinism, Reformed theology equals what? Don't evangelize. Now, we've heard why that's not the case, but for many people, that's what it equals. So you start talking about these things, they think you don't care about missions, you don't think about evangelism. So you have to work through that misunderstanding. Second, the objections, though they may come by way of intellectual arguments, are often emotional objections more than even intellectual objections. So if you just go at the level of, I got another verse and another verse and another verse, and I did this, I mean, I... I set people up when I was in college and was really getting a hold of these doctrines of grace. They were getting a hold of me and would ask people a, a question. And so then they'd say, well, well then, you know, how, how, how can, I mean, isn't God unfair? And then I would turn to Romans 9, who are you, old man, to talk back to God? There it is. There's the answer. <laughs> people walk away crying and I sort of feel like doing my bit. Now, how many people did that help? So you have to understand that when you talk about the doctrines of grace, some people will immediately feel washed over with great joy and freedom, and other people they think of, but my mom's not a Christian. Does God hate my mom? Why didn't God choose my mom? Um, My daughter is wandering from Christ. Are you saying that it doesn't matter what she do, she's not elect and she's never going to be saved? So you have to understand those sort of gut 
level objections are there with people, which means we need to deal patiently, we need to ask questions, we need to be willing that for most people, and, and any of us in this room who have embraced these doctrines, for most of us, it's over a process. And it is that I see it, I don't like it, there's a tension, maybe tension resolved, or maybe come to embrace these things. And we need to allow that other people are going to walk through a similar path most often. Which means that the, the more impersonal the medium, the less likely we're to be effective. You know, uh, but if we think our doctrine is better, and we do, the, the, then uh, the effects in our lives ought to be more gracious. And we're not, if, we, if we think we understand a great treasure from God, I, I think we do, well then we ought to bear the marks of that and there ought to be a spirituality that reflects this great thing that's been given us, this knowledge, this, this truth. And so uh, we, we want to commend with grace the doctrines of grace. I, I once heard Sinclair Ferguson pray, and I've often prayed it myself afterwards, uh, help us to understand not only the doctrines of grace, but to receive the grace of the doctrines. And, uh, you know, that was very helpful about that. If we could, sometimes we can clarify confusion. That's a valuable thing to do. Uh, but uh, we want to be careful. Trent, it's, you want to I was going to ask you guys, you know, books, so Sovereignty of God, Election, and all those are good, and Sproul and Horton and all the things. You, uh, I've read those. I do believe in books. Which one of those, or maybe a different one, would be best if someone here is just, I'm wrestling with it, or I got a family member? Because there's certain ones that would just drop on you, and they're all good, but what's the one to give to the, the person really struggling, a sort of skeptic of these doctrines? I mean, I think it, we do want to be wise as the, as the person. If we're going to give A.W. Pink's The Sovereignty of God to someone who has an emotional objection, they're just not going to get far into it because right. it's a very logical, biblical, overwhelming. It's, it's, he's not harsh, but right. it's just, it's just an intellectual and spiritual you know, avalanche on you. That's not going to be the average person. I mean, I think uh, Sproul is going to be much more relatable. Actually, I wrote my book, What's So Great About the Doctrines of Grace, to be short and to be something you would give to someone who had initial questions about it. And so those types of things, what would you say about that, Trent, as well? Yeah, Chosen by God, your book, both good. Um, this wouldn't be to exactly your question, but maybe the college student who's wrestling with the question. Uh, the Pleasures of God was helpful for me. I was already there, but when I read The Pleasures of God... Piper. Years ago, by John Piper, yeah, he comes at the question of what makes God happy, and um, and he'll he'll end up at the bruising of his son. So you end up with, and and of course Piper's walking along texts all the way through his book and connecting dots. Um, that book, um, that book made God bigger, and it made those things make even more sense. Let me give you another book. Uh, the last book that James Boyce authored, in fact, Phil Riken concluded it so it's Reichen and Boyce, was called The Doctrines of Grace. And if you're like a college student or a, a relatively new believer, and you, you think you see it, but you want to see it fleshed out biblically, that's a tremendous book. The doctor, or I think, what's so great about No, it's just The Doctrines of Grace is what it's called. Uh, and, oh, was, the original title was Whatever Happened to the Doctrines of Grace, but I think it's just The Doctrines of Grace. It's a really helpful book. If you're saying, okay, I, I'd like to explore it, and flesh it out. That's a really excellent resource. Uh, let me give you another question, Trent. Mm -hmm. All on the same theme, but it's a little uh, varied to it. Maybe this will be our last question. How is it helpful to explain to an unbeliever questioning a loving God, choosing which humans to save? As a pastor, how do you comfort a believer grieving the loss of an unsaved family member? So that's along the lines of what we've been saying a little bit, but specifically, uh, what's bothering them is it doesn't seem right, right? And it seems like it, instead of commending God, it actually it presents an offensive view of God because he's sovereign. How do you deal with those issues? So someone who questions why a loving God would choose which humans to save. Um, Paul in, Paul, this is maybe not the first place I'd take him, it's immediately what comes to mind is Paul, Paul gets the anguish, I think of Romans 9 book ended by, he's in anguish over the souls of his kinsmen 
So deeply longs for their salvation. So the person who is longing for the salvation of a friend and a little bit perplexed by this doctrine if they're rummaging around in the scriptures and discovering the sovereignty of God, they actually have a friend in the Apostle Paul verses around the most striking statements that he makes in Romans 9. Um, And then, one second here, and then right at the back end of Romans 9, Romans 10, Yeah, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer <laughs> for them is that they may be saved. So, I mean, in some ways, this person needs some listening and some time and a coffee and then another coffee and then to keep coming to church and keep reading the Bible. Um, because there's a theology of prayer to be developed and these things don't happen overnight. So a person struggling with the doctrine of election and their lost friends, um, I can relate with that. I mean, th- th- theologically... Uh, you know, the only, (laughs) I think of my, my own father who doesn't know the Lord. So early on as a Christian, I would, my anguish and my consternation and my difficulty was over how this could ever happen. As I grew in my theology, as I came to understand how I became a Christian in the first place, it didn't relax me with respect to his salvation or the salvation of a friend, but it actually gave me confidence that now that I know our actual problem that explains why a person's heart is hard in front of me. And now that I know how I actually got saved, I can actually believe that this can happen. Amen. So I have, I have at the same time no confidence that my mere words, human words, or, his, or, a, or a friend or a family member's human experience of those words can bring them to salvation. So there's no place for coercion a restlessness, and I think that early on as a Christian, even in some of my evangelism, there was a restlessness which was a bit repelling, and most of us can relate with that. But as my understanding of God matured from Scripture itself, you relax and at the same time grow more confidence and more, and more bold. Um, so you mentioned a second person who's, speaking of somebody who died who's an unbeliever, and my, I mean, my word there is that there's no comfort in death for the lost. I mean, from God's word, there's no comfort. So the best we can do is thank God that there's time for us to believe and then to preach the gospel and pray for those that, that are still alive and have breath. You know, I like to say at some point, we've got to lay down our humanism and embrace God's theism. And what I mean by that is humanism says the greatest good is what is the greatest for the most humans. And so the best world would be the one where most humans benefited the most. That's humanism. God is not a humanist. God is a theist. The Bible teaches that the greatest good is the greatest display of the perfections of the glories of all of God's attributes. So we think it would be better if no one went to hell, humanistically. But the Bible says, no, God is glorified in the display of his wrath. And he glorifies an attribute by exercising that attribute. And God is glorified in his judgment of the reprobate so that his glory of his wrath and his justice and his power would be made known. That's why the book of Isaiah ends with the elect looking over the porch of heaven into hell and giving praise to God. I have a hard time working through that because I'm still processing my humanism. But in heaven, I'm going to be a pure theist. Hmm. And so one of the biggest things for us to finally just embrace as an act of worship and submission to God is the display of your glory is the greatest of all goods. And that perspective is going to take away a lot of former questions. And at some point, I remember wrestling with that and just laying my humanism down and saying, my humanism is an idol. You are God that you would be glorified is the greatest good. And therefore, while on one level I find it enormously painful to think about things, I can yet praise you that you are sovereignly glorifying the fullness of your person. In our humanism, we would like some attributes of God to be glorified and others not to be glorified. Even when we start talking that way, we start to go, that's that's my problem. I, I need to yield myself to the God who is God and all things are for him. And until we get there, and there's going to be a struggle to get there, we're going to struggle with a lot of these issues. I'll give you the last word. Uh, I don't know if it's a great last word, but th- this is not what you would say in that moment, but this is a, theo- 
theological distinction that's important for us to have in our head, and both of these men are hitting upon it. The Reformed theologians, in talking about reprobation, always distinguish between preterition and condemnation. That is to say, God does not, people are not condemned arbitrarily. God does not say, I think I'll, for no good reason, I'll, I'll damn you and I'll condemn you. We're talking about the ineffable mystery of his sovereign will, whereby he has mercy on some and not on others. But you read carefully, and Reformed theologians make this important distinction. So, preterition is the decree in the mind of God to pass by those, and you can get into whether it's superlapsarian or infralapsarian, you want to know more, happy to talk about it. Uh, but pass by those and not show mercy upon those. Again, this is an eternity past in his mind's eye who uh, are in need of grace. Condemnation then is the decree to justly punish those who are sinners. So, reprobation and election are the eternal divine decree, but there are means then to the end. So, we don't want people to think um, someone is going to be in hell because God just arbitrarily said, I think I'll punish you. They're being punished not because of a decree. They're being punished because they are sinners, all of which relate to these divine decrees. But they're condemned because they're sinners deserving of that punishment. So there's a distinction between in that decree, the preterition whereby God chooses not to show mercy upon the sinner, and then the just act of condemnation for sinners who deserve it. You don't get into all of that in the moment of someone losing their loved one, but you have it in your own understanding because you will need at times to correct, and I sometimes see even re Reformed brothers who think they're being valiant for truth, but they're really putting forward a very crass, caricatured view of Reformed theology that doesn't have the nuances that Reformed theologians have typically given it. But you're not denying the illustration of the potter and the clay. God has decreed that some they would be passed purpose, over. Some for noble purposes, some for... Yes. Exactly. It, it's, a, it's not that God is not sovereign over, over reprobation. But as God looks down, and this reveals my infralapsarian perspective... I'm which, infralapsarian which clearly, also. I, clearly you are. But I think, the, I think Romans 9 shows that God is not looking down at a neutral mass of people with a daisy. Daisy is not the reformed flower. I love me, she, he loves me, he loves me not. I love him, I love him not. Uh, rather, he's looking down at a mass of humanity that is hell-bent for condemnation by the very love of sin. And he sovereignly chooses to pass by certain persons. So we don't, we don't want to unsovereign that decision, clearly. He is sovereign over all things. That includes the reprobation of the damned. And yet, the persons he is choosing to pass by are people who are getting what they wanted and the consequences of it. Whereas, when it comes to the elect, now there's this personal interaction. There's this graciousness in bringing them out. And so, uh, there is secondary causation within divine sovereignty that's hugely important that people have rejected willfully the God who offered them grace, did so genuinely. Yes, all that's decreed by God, but that's where that human will comes in. Why is that person... I'll even go so far as to argue, and we've got to stop or we're just going forever, that the language of Romans 9 is personal when it comes to the elect and impersonal when it comes to the non-elect. You have pro horizo, predestined for the elect. You have horizo, more general for them. And so there's an asymmetry hmm. with, re with regard to the, the personal touch of God, as it were, with respect to sovereign salvation and sovereign reprobation. But God is sovereign over it all, and, and he's displaying in everyone who goes to hell is, was decreed to glorify God's justice and wrath and power, and it is good that God was glorified. That's not very humanistic.